Welcome to episode 3 of the Investor's Guide to Battery Materials. This is part of a regular series providing both private and professional investors with all the information that they're likely to need in order to help them invest in the world of battery materials. In this episode, I'm going to talk about manganese and in particular high purity manganese. It's a material that not many non-specialists in this sector have ever encountered before and as a result, it's a material that I think is widely misunderstood by the market. This is the first of two episodes on high purity manganese. Before we start, I'll just give a quick introduction. My name is Matt Fernley and I'm Managing Director of Battery Materials Review. I've been an equity analyst specialising in the mining and basic materials sectors for over 20 years. During that time, I've been a broker as well as an investor, both professional and private, and I've written a number of primers on various aspects of the mining sector to help explain them to investors. I started Battery Materials Review a few years ago as a one-stop shop for everything investors and companies would need to know about what's going on in the wider battery and battery materials sectors. I'd also like to specifically thank this edition's sponsor, which is Euromanganese. Euromanganese is a Canadian waste recycling company whose principal focus is advancing the evaluation and development of the Kalavitse manganese project in which it holds 100% interest. The proposed project entails reprocessing of a significant manganese deposit hosted in historic mine tailings from a decommissioned mine which is strategically located in the Czech Republic. Euro Manganese's goal is to become a leading, competitive and environmentally superior primary producer of ultra-high purity manganese products in the heart of Europe, serving both the lithium-ion battery industry as well as producers of specialty steel and aluminium alloys. I want to start off by talking about the applications of manganese in the battery industry. There are two different primary battery chemistries that use manganese and I think there's a perception outside the industry that the manganese used for them is interchangeable. The problem is, it isn't. Up until the past few years, the primary battery chemistry that used manganese was lithium manganese oxide or LMO. LMO batteries use a manganese oxide compound called spinel as a cathode material. LMO batteries are not as energy dense as newer lithium ion battery chemistries so they don't have such a long range in electric vehicles and tend to be used more for consumer applications. The raw material for these batteries is electrolytic manganese dioxide or EMD which can be easily and cheaply produced from manganese oxide ores which is the most common mined occurrence of manganese. But as energy density has become more important in electric vehicles battery chemistries have evolved and the most recent chemistry that's in focus for high performance electric vehicle batteries is a chemistry called NCM or nickel cobalt manganese. Sometimes just to confuse us it's known as NMC or nickel manganese cobalt as well. Here the manganese is part of a complex metal oxide in association with nickel and cobalt. To form this complex metal oxide manganese sulfate is mixed with nickel and cobalt sulfates and also lithium and formed into a lithium NCM oxide. Now the processing route for the manganese used in NCM batteries is very different from that that's used for LMO, partly due to the specifications and higher purity requirements of NCM batteries. The earliest formulation of NCM was called NCM111 and contained equal parts of nickel, cobalt and manganese as well as lithium and oxygen in its structure. Because of concerns about the sustainability and the security of the cobalt supply chain as well as cobalt prices, battery manufacturers and EV makers have looked to reduce the amount of cobalt used in batteries. So over time NCM523 took over from NCM111 and then NCM622. And the lowest cobalt chemistry currently used in batteries is NCM811. Another important point is that manganese is substantially cheaper than cobalt, which is seen as a key point in battery economics. There are plans afoot to go even lower cobalt, and at its battery day in September 2020, Tesla announced that it is planning a nickel manganese battery, which would have no cobalt at all, and potentially as much as 33% manganese. Having said that, the current formulations of NCM that are most commonly used in electric vehicles are NCM 622 and 811. 
I would also note that the higher nickel formulations tend to have higher energy density and hence a longer range. So it isn't all just about cobalt. One of the issues with cutting cobalt is that batteries may be prone to thermal instability. Manganese can act as a stabilizing agent and that's why it's present in this type of cell formulation. In my view, high purity manganese of the type that's used in high nickel battery chemistries is the most scarce of all the battery materials. But it's interesting that manganese as a material doesn't show up in the EU's critical raw material list. The reason for that is that manganese is used as a key additive in the steel industry and supply of the element manganese is abundant. The only problem is that the type of manganese that's used in the steel industry isn't generally suitable for manufacture of high nickel cathode materials, at least on an economic or sustainability basis. That's a different type of manganese altogether. So let's just look at the breakdown of manganese supply in the world. In 2019, which is the last year for which we have data, 22.5 million tonnes of manganese containing materials were produced. Of that 22.5 million tonnes, 90% was used for making ferro alloys for the steel industry. Only just over 1.5% of that manganese went into making EMD for LMO batteries, and only 0.15% of manganese went to make materials suitable for NCM batteries. Now I plan to talk a little bit more about the supply side of high purity manganese in my second presentation, so I don't want to overshare on the supply side, but I did want to point out how small this high purity manganese subset is of the overall manganese industry. The growth in high purity manganese demand then will effectively be based on the evolution of the NCM battery chemistry and to a smaller extent Tesla's NCMA battery chemistry which is expected to start to incorporate small amounts of high purity manganese to replace cobalt over the next few years. Once Tesla gets its new NM battery into commercial production this should also be a major driver. But Tesla is not the only company pursuing a high manganese battery. Chinese battery producer s -Volt already has a high manganese battery in commercial production and fellow producer Pharasis is also planning one. So to enable us to forecast high purity manganese demand for batteries, we have to forecast the market share of key battery chemistries. And an illustration of my forecast is on the chart on this page. At BMR, we're forecasting that NCM batteries of one chemistry or another are likely to constitute around 50% of all electric car batteries over the next 10 years. So the next thing we have to do is forecast electric car sales. My electric car sales forecast is shown in the chart and you can see that I'm forecasting very substantial growth in sales which is one of the reasons I'm so excited about battery raw materials demand in general and high purity manganese in particular. Plug-in EV sales, that's battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles or BEVs and PHEVs as they're known in the business, were about 3 million globally in 2020. We're currently in February 2021 as I record this, forecasting that they'll reach about 14 million units per year in 2025 and over 33 million per year by 2030. Once we have an estimate of what battery chemistries are going to look like and what we think car sales will do, we can forecast high purity manganese demand. It's not quite that simple, that's an approximation. We also make an assumption on what's going to happen to battery sizes and what the split will be between plug-in hybrid EVs and battery only EVs, but it's close enough for jazz. Now if you think back to how small that high purity manganese segment was on the earlier chart, it may be represented some 35,000 tonnes of contained manganese used for NCM batteries in 2019. If you now factor in the increase in electric car sales, I think you can see why I would expect demand for high purity manganese to increase almost exponentially. And in fact, I'm forecasting that the high purity manganese market is set to grow by about 16 times by 2030. That's an awful lot of growth. I just want to talk a little bit about what we call the precursors of the manganese that are used in high performance batteries. I'll cover more of this in the second presentation, but it's important to understand these for the next part of the discussion. The major material that's used to manufacture high performance lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide cathodes is high purity 
manganese sulfate monohydrate. That's quite a tongue twister and we tend to abbreviate it to HPMSM. Cathode makers have a choice between buying high purity electrolytic manganese metal known as HPEMM and then upgrading it or buying the HPMSM directly. The HPMSM is then mixed with nickel and cobalt sulfates and reacted with sodium carbonate to produce a mixed metal carbonate, which is then mixed with lithium carbonate or hydroxide and calcined to produce the lithium NCM oxide that makes the cathode. Now one aspect that's very important in high nickel batteries is this issue of purity. As many participants in the battery industry will tell you, it's not so much the absolute purity of battery raw materials that's important in battery manufacture as the consistency of the impurities. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let's talk about purity. In a battery industry context, when we're talking about a high quality battery grade material, we're generally talking about what we call a 3N material. 3N stands for three nines or 99.9% .9 purity. That means for 3N material, we're talking about a continuous specification with only 0.1% impurities compared to 2N material, which has 1% impurities. When we're talking about battery materials, talking about purity is actually a bit of a misnomer. So let's talk about impurities. The difference between 99% and 99.9% .9 purity probably doesn't sound too much, does it? But if we say that's the difference between 10,000 parts per million of impurities and 1,000 parts per million, maybe you start to get an idea of the magnitude of the difference in chemical terms. 99% material has 10 times the amount of impurities as 99.9%, .9%, and in a chemical process that is extremely significant. And what the impurities are is very important as well. Some elements are what we call deleterious to battery production. Some of these are elements which are very common in manganese ore bodies, particularly iron, or elements which are used in treatment of manganese for the ferroalloy industry, such as selenium. NCM battery raw materials must be selenium free and should generally have less than 10 parts per million of iron. This means that the number of ore bodies that are suitable to produce high purity manganese with an economically viable cost structure and in a sustainable manner is limited. Metallic impurities are particularly dangerous because they can form plates, piercing the separator and resulting in shorts in the cell which can cause explosions and fires. Here are a couple of specifications for battery grade manganese precursor products, both HPEMM and HPMSM. You can see how low the iron concentration must be and the very low concentrations of other metals with a typical battery grade product. In the industry, we talk a lot about qualification in battery materials. Qualification is the process which a raw material or intermediate material producer needs to go through in order for their material to be contracted by a cathode maker or cell manufacturer. Qualification is largely about ensuring consistent compliance to a demanding specification. Buyers need to qualify a lot of suppliers to ensure consistency for their supply. But qualification is not a standalone process, it is an ongoing one. It doesn't end because a material is accepted by a user. Qualification is a constant process and material produced must be regularly checked. Inconsistencies in materials result in weakness in the batteries which can cause poor performance or fires. Qualification in battery materials projects generally takes of the order of 12 to 18 months but may take up to two years. Many mining management teams who are pushing fast-track startups suggest that they can bring an asset into production and then worry about selling it to the industry. While this is eminently viable in the industrial minerals industry, it's always a big red flag to me as a battery industry specialist since it suggests that the management team doesn't understand the specific needs of the battery materials industry or hasn't really engaged with potential clients. I do want to talk about qualification in a bit of detail because it's such a key factor of the modern battery materials industry. This page shows a representative qualification timeline for a cathode materials project. Some qualification periods may be shorter, 
some may be longer. But because of the requirement to source large amounts of testing material, the development profile of battery raw materials producers has had to change substantially in the past few years. In the old days, a company simply needed to define its resource, do a scoping study, a pre-feasibility and feasibility study, and it would get funded. It would do initial metallurgical test work as part of its scoping study, potentially with a small amount of material, and then it would use a larger composite sample from drill cores, or sometimes, but not always, a bulk sample for its detailed feasibility work. But that isn't enough for the new version of the battery materials industry. Much more material is now needed for acceptance testing, and potential buyers want visibility that a company can match its promised spec over the long term. Best practice for battery materials projects under development is now to have three stages of metallurgical test work. Laboratory or bench scale testing at the scoping study or PFS stage, pilot plant testing in the feasibility process, and finally a demonstration plant which might be a scaled down version of the final plant design, which will take place in the latter stages of feasibility work. This adds cost and time to the development pathway, but it's becoming increasingly required by users of battery materials to enable them to sign off take contracts. If a company claims to have a battery materials project and is not doing this scale of test work, as an investor, you should be asking why isn't it? In practice, output from different types of occurrence of the same material will have different chemical composition from others. So, for instance, nickel sulfate from a nickel sulfide ore body might have a very different chemical makeup to that from a nickel laterite ore body. Or lithium hydroxide made from a hard rock source in Australia might be very different from lithium hydroxide converted from lithium carbonate from a Latin American brine. The differences might seem to be minute, but they'll be there. Similarly, different materials will also have different impurities. So the impurities from a high purity manganese will be very different from those in nickel or lithium. Because of the low tolerance for impurities in a battery cell, most cathode manufacturers will balance off material from different sources against one another. So for instance, the nickel used in one cathode might have a relatively high iron content. Hence, the cobalt, manganese and lithium will need to have a low iron content. So cathode manufacturing is about trading off the different impurities in different sources of materials to make a viable cathode. What this means then is that once qualified with a particular user, one project is not necessarily fungible with another. If project A breaks down, material may not be able to be substituted from project B or project C without a formulation of the cathode manufacturing process. This is why it's important that battery materials are understood to be a specialty and not a commodity product. In the next episode on high purity manganese, I'm going to take what I've just explained about purity and impurities and apply it to my discussion of the supply chain. I'll talk about why the majority of manganese deposits in the world aren't suitable for production of high purity manganese and discuss the economic and sustainability issues surrounding manufacture of high purity manganese for batteries. So thanks very much for listening to this presentation. If you want more information, you can listen to our Recharge podcast at the address below, or you can subscribe to our monthly journal at www.batterymaterialsreview.com, or you can tune in to more of our Investor's Guide series via our YouTube page. If there are any topics you'd like me to discuss in the future, please leave a comment on the YouTube page or drop me a line via the Contact Us section on the Battery Materials Review website. I'm Matt Fernley, editor of Battery Materials Review, and goodbye for now.